Welcome to the State of Working America podcast, where we seek to elevate workers' voices to ensure they're heard in the economic policy debate here in Washington and beyond. I'm your host, Pedro da Costa, and I have a real treat for you guys today. It's my pleasure to welcome Patrice Kunesh. She is the director of the Minneapolis Fed's Center for Indian Country Development. And uh, we get to talk about something that is just not ever in the news, not ever in the press. In fact, I, I would say there's negative coverage of this issue, which is uh, Native Americans and their role in the economy and the challenges uh, they face. So welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm just thrilled to be here. It's my pleasure. So, uh, you know, we, we spoke a while back uh, when I was reporting on the Fed, and, uh, and you taught me about the concept of asterisk nation, and that stuck with me. And I was wondering if you could explain to our listeners what that means. Yes, we use the term asterisk nation to reflect the fact that American Indians, Native Alaskans, Native Hawaiians, indigenous peoples generally are not included in the conversation, in the reporting, in the data collection, data collection ar around really important types of information, social economic conditions, ec um, educational attainment, and such. Oftentimes you'll see a report come out on the well-being of children and there's no reference to Native Americans. There'll be uh, the white population, the black population, Hispanic, Asian, but there'll be nothing about Native Americans. And what you'll find is an asterisk at the bottom of the page or maybe in the footnotes that referenced to an other category. We're sort of collected generally in an other category or not collected at all. So what does that mean? It means that we're invisible. And when we're invisible, we feel like that's a modern form of racism, tell you the truth. Now, Native Americans are not races in, in the, poli we're political entities. The relationship between tribes and the federal government is a legal political relationship, as is the relationship between citizens and the tribal nation. But to not be included in any demographic information uh, is, is a form of, of denigration and, and being dismissive. And the Native population is a very significant part of the overall um, history and culture and, and society of the United States. Of course, we're the first Americans here. And uh, we want to be counted. Not only do we want to be counted, we want to show the, the disparities in terms of how our communities, how our peoples are performing relative to others. And that, in turn, then shows where uh, policies are not working, what policies are broken, where the inflection points are in, in terms of um, where we need to study more. So Asterix Nation is uh, something that we really need to overcome, and we can do that by having conversations like this, by uh, having economists and researchers really take a close look, and even even my institution, including Native Americans in the employment demographics and as part of the, the overall uh, population to which it's responsible. So as a Fed reporter, I was fascinated to stumble upon the, uh, the incredible uh, machine that is the community development function of the Fed that a lot of people don't know exists right. because people think of the Fed as a regulatory body and also as an interest rate setting agency, but they don't know that the community development work exists. And the reason I, you know, really enjoyed it as a reporter was that it, or it covers the social issues that I'm really interested in. And, and in your case, it covers an area, again, of economics that, that nobody's paying attention to. Can you talk about some of the work that your center is doing specifically and about some of the findings uh, that your research has come up with, and yeah. particularly some of the more shocking statistics and disparities that you find. Okay. Uh, well, the Center for Indian Country Development was established four and a half years ago, and I was actually in Washington, D.C. at the time that I was recruited for the job. Uh, I was overseeing the Rural Development Agency at uh, the Department of Agriculture, and I saw the enormous influence of you know, federal funds going into building communities, literally from the ground up, building homes, providing uh, utilities and broadband. 
And so when I, when I stepped into the center role and, and tried to figure out, well, okay, where can we really make a difference? I wanted to look at, at, uh, at where the money is. And then, of course, well, where the money isn't. And housing and home ownership was a big part of that. So I knew that um, home ownership is a part of foundational wealth development, asset building. And I wanted to examine, well, what does that look like in Indian country? We know that education is a, a big equalizer, but what about access to, to good quality education? So we, we, we brought in a, a, an education component. And then everything in Indian country touches and concerns the land. So we said, let's figure out what is the, how does the land influence community and economic development? And then uh, private economies, business development, entrepreneurship was our fourth area that we, that we took a look at. And right off the bat, I have to say that uh, some of the, the research findings we, we encountered were really quite shocking. Um, and, and for example, we found that um, in, in terms of home ownership, we, we might on the one hand see a very general high rate of home ownership in Indian country, but these are homes that have been inherited or built by themselves. These are not homes that have been acquired through a, a mortgage. And when we started looking at the HMDA data, the Home Mortgage Disclosure Act data, we were really um, surprised. We find that conventional lenders have really retreated from the market. We find that Native American financial institutions have stepped in to fill that void of capital, these CDFI funds, for example, Native banks, Native credit unions. But then when we took a closer look um, at how federal programs are, are performing, we found that one program in particular, the HUD 184 Home Loan Guarantee, which is synonymous, as, as it says on its webpage, with home ownership, was really bypassing the reservation. And it showed us two things. One is that there is a strong demand for home ownership amongst Native American borrowers. And that also showed that they have the capacity to borrow, meaning they have good income and, and, and worthy credit scores. But it also showed us that where this lending was happening was off the reservation which means that uh, the whole point of building communities around housing and home ownership with good schools and recreation and such and so forth was missing Indian country in a big way. Billions of dollars were actually being diverted off the reservation. And that is really striking because uh, home ownership, having a home, a safe, secure, reliable home to come to, to come home to is, is sort of the foundation of, of any community. And uh, we needed to shine a light on it and, and really show folks that um, we're not there yet and, and why aren't we there. And we find that although Native peoples have, con um, have sovereignty over their lands, they don't have control over the processes to allow them put, to put the land to good and productive use. Can you explain that a little bit? Yes. Um, the, the, the lands that are held, um, the lands on reservations are held by the federal government, uh, legal ownership. Um, and, and so these are called trust lands. And these trust lands, although they're original Indian lands or native people's lands, uh, the federal government has control over the use. So I wanted to get a, a mortgage on my allotted lands on the South Dakota side of the Standing Rock Reservation. I have to go to the, to the Bureau of Indian Affairs of the Department of the Interior. And that office has uh, an elaborate process for leasehold mortgages. It has another elaborate process for obtaining a mortgage and then getting certified title reports. And oftentimes it can take you know, five years to close a mortgage on the lands, which is a huge disincentive for any sort of lender to to work in Indian country. So that is. So I was going to ask you. So is was it whether it was an issue of 
redlining an issue of lack of proximity to the actual financial institutions, but you're telling me that there's a structural issue that really underlies the lack of, because, you know, if people are, have high income and they're good credits, yes. you'd think the, yes. the banks would have an incentive yes. to go there. Yes, and this was a, a, a guaranteed loan pro product, right? So the disincentive is the bureaucracy that's um, just elaborate and, and, and multi-layered and... Uh, HUD's process is different than the rural development, which is different from the VA. So very few lenders really want to get into this business of lending because it is so enormously complex, time-consuming, and obviously costly. What are some of the challenges on the employment side, and what are the uh, what are the unemployment rates like uh, in various areas compared to? to the rest of the population? So that will vary. We have 573 tribal nations, and each one has a very distinct uh, footprint and, and, and community. Um, and so what we see generally, that uh, employment uh, on reservations tend to be really centered around gaming. Those tribes that have gaming, um, you can see that have, have, have very healthy employment uh, records. And, and employment um, means also benefits, and benefits is health care. It means like you have retirement accounts. And, 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 the, and, and we see some really, really strong economic development. Those tribes that do not have um, gaming uh, and, and tribal governments that turn to either natural resources or other types of economic development, sometimes we'll see higher unemployment rates. And uh, in those communities, we also see, though, higher self-employment rates. So there's a, there's a different kind of economy operating. It may not be this uh, typical currency exchange um, in, 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 outside of Indian country. I wanted to ask you, are there challenges that Native American women face that are distinct from, from say, other women and other minorities? Because, I, you know, I, whenever I read about it, I hear about a lot of stories of, uh, you know, just, uh, just terrible, terrible rates of abuse and, 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 right. and the like. Right. There is a, there's a, a, a tragic, uh, pervasive uh, sense of violence against Native women, but it, it also is, um, it comes through in, in economic ways. So for example, um, education. We see more Native women in, in, in different forms of education, higher education, but we may not see women in the workforce or they're not being compensated in the workforce at the same level or degree. Um, we see women um, suffering from uh, health problems, you know, certainly lack of maternal health care and then post, uh, postnatal health care really uh, hurts, and literally, physically uh, hurts Native women. But you touched on something that, um, that is so prevalent and so striking, and that is the violence against women. And uh, the Department of Justice, the, the Center for uh, Disease Control, what have you, have all looked at this, and, and Native women uh, suffer disproportionately, grossly disproportionately high um, incidence of violence. And this is all sorts of violence, from sexual violence and trafficking to uh, physical violence, high mortality rates, and we think it's from, from violent encounters. We recently did a study uh, of the Minneapolis police, uh, and we, it was a general study by somebody um, outside of, of, of the center, but what they found and shared with us was really alarming, and that was the encounters of Minneapolis police. And we thought, oh, it may be black people, it may be black male people, but what was really striking was that uh, it was a significantly high proportionate encounter with Native women, and they'd be stopped as you know suspicious as a suspicious person. Now maybe there was a good outcome, like the police officer was walking the woman home, but this says something that there's something else going on, perhaps, and it's geographically located. 
So we're seeing uh, the development of task forces across several states to study public safety with regards to Native women. And that really is about data collection and data sharing. Because as we see a criminal jurisdiction on reservations or uh, outside the reservations, shared responsibilities between the federal, state, and tribal law enforcement uh, authorities, they're just not talking to each other. So we really don't know where things are happening and where things are missing. But we do know that um, an inordinate number of Native women have gone missing and those absences have not been investigated. They've turned up uh, brutally beaten or murdered, and that has not been investigated. And the sad thing is that we believe that there's a gross underreporting of violent incidences as well. So whatever we think we know, I think it's actually a lot worse. Wow. Yeah. That's really sobering. You mentioned, you mentioned data, and of course, you're at the Federal Reserve, and data is your bed and butter. Uh, I was wondering what obstacles have you run into as far as finding relevant data, uh, you know, and, and being able to, to get as granular as you'd like to be about, uh, about Native American populations? It's really hard to get data. We usually uh, end up with U.S. Census data or American Survey data, which is uh, very aggregated data. And what we really want to know is the lived experience, the real experience in our communities. And to do that, it would be very costly. It would be um, uh, quite an elaborate process. But that's where we want to go. We've got a project underway. And I find it, I think it's going to be really exciting where we have a, a native-owned bank um, that has a very uh, well-established um, financial institution in greater Wisconsin. And they want to open up a branch in the community of another tribal nation that has no financial institution. So here we're at the very front end and we're able to evaluate through survey, through community conversation, the uptake and the attitudes toward having a financial institution in the community. Does that mean that people will have uh, savings accounts and will that savings account um, uh, lead to uh, good credit scores and that credit scores then support home ownership or or other kind of you know really essential um, lending and borrowing. So that's the kind of, I think, research that we need is at the community level from the community. And we just didn't go out there and say, let's do it. We had to go through the IRB process uh, of the uh, receiving community. And they really had to know and understand our motivations. Because, of course, you can imagine there's a lot of distrust of, of large institutions. Sure. Well, actually, that, that's exactly what my next question was. It's, you spoke about the economic diversity. Of course, there's an enormous range of cultural diversity uh, among tribes. How does that make it difficult to organize, you know, politically and civically as a, a, kind, of, a kind of constructive unit, if you will? And, and how are those bridges gapped between various tribes? Yeah. That's a good, that's a good question. You know, historically, tribes have really collaborated with, with other tribal nations, and they had very extensive networks uh, for commerce and trade. Of course, they would recognize each other's leaders, and if there was a challenge against them, they would literally band together to, uh, to fend off those forces. And uh, nowadays, we have economic forces, we have political forces. And one of the, the really good organizations working um, across Indian country, pan-Indian, if you will, is the, Native, uh, is the National Congress of American Indians. And they are a member organization that represent a majority of tribes. And they're here in Washington, D.C., and they are out there advocating every day and in so many ways for Native American issues, political, social, legal issues. They're also regional uh, organizations like the Great Plains Tribal Leaders Association and the Rocky Mountain Tribal Leaders Association. 
And I think uh, more recently they've come together to look at regional economies and what can they do collectively uh, uh, to, to benefit the larger whole. And how do you, how do you uh, see Native American uh, activists integrating with a broader civil rights movement and community? I mean, it, I feel like there's a lot of activism happening around the country, yeah. uh, whether it's uh, union protests or, uh, you know, we had, I think the most prominent news event um, in the Native American community were the Keystone Pipeline protests that now, as we see, there, there has been a spill. So the concerns of, 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 uh, of the people there seem to have uh, come to pass. So I was just wondering how you see uh, Native Americans integrating into the broader uh, civil rights community. It's, it's actually, uh, I, I think, um, a lot of good energy, a lot of good energy. And uh, the Keystone um, situation happened on the Standing Rock Reservation near Cannonball, which is where my family uh, resides. And it was uh, very disruptive in, in a lot of ways, both to the community, to the state, to the region. Um, and, but it was disruptive in, an, in a good way in that we really had to take a close look at how do we organize, um, what's the framework, and, and what's the, the message, right? Um, I, my first job out of law school was with the Native American Rights Fund in Boulder, Colorado. And I think of them as uh, not only a public interest uh, a law firm that took on uh, treaty rights, but they really showed and, and, and laid the way for legal activism that, that, that I think leads to economic activism that leads to social activism, especially around Indian child welfare, around environmental issues like, like water and sacred sites, um, cultural issues like language uh, and, and, um, uh, and, and so forth. What we're seeing, though, from a lot of these other activities is a sense of um, uh, needing to get out and vote. And I, I'm, I'm hoping that um, as we think of housing and we think of education, as we think of uh, really building community, we're also supporting civic engagement. And there's actually a study, uh, a study by um, an indigenous economist, Randy Aki, that showed higher income in this one community, the Eastern Band of Cherokee, and it was a very modest increase of, of, of income, actually had very positive impacts. And one of the impacts was uh, more civic engagement. And, and, and I think once we have a sense of, of stability or security, we, we have some, um, some opportunity to say, okay, how can I help support the rest of the community? So I, I, I certainly hope that, that civic engagement is spread far and wide. We've got some terrific advocates out there right now. Uh, new organizations called Illuminative by Crystal Echohawk, Indian Collective with Nick Tilson, really fantastic on the ground community oriented sort of activist type organizations so i know we have to let you get back to the mild minneapolis weather but i want to ask you as we're having this conversation it dawns on me that as you said you are the first americans and yet most americans know so little about native american culture uh and are taught so little uh in school how should uh, schools integrate, you know, Native American history into their curriculum in a way that doesn't uh, sort of commoditize yeah. or kind of uh, mischaracterize uh, Native Native American yeah. culture? Well, I think this is part of a, another sort of social activism effort underway, which is called reclaiming Native truth. And, um, and, and, and words matter. You know, for example, we, we hear a lot of, of talk about tribal and tribalism. And actually, it's used in a, de, in a derisive way, right? It's, it means faction and division when, in fact, you know, Native communities are, are really about a communal or community experience and, and the bonds and connections to the land. So I think we need to be mindful of that. We need to be mindful of mascots and, and other types of cultural appropriation. 
Um, As we, we're here in the home of the Redskins. No, so, we don't. Yeah. That, 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 I shall not say that. Well, no, I'm, I, I, <laughs> I'm all for changing the name. So, yeah. you know. But 72% of Americans almost never, never actually encounter or seek out information about Native Americans. And 27 states have, have no mention of Native Americans in their K-12 curriculum. And more than that, 87% of state history standards do not mention Native American history after 1900. So again, Asterix Nation, we don't exist, we're invisible. And, and some states actually erase tribes and reservations off their official maps. They just don't want us to, to exist. So what are the consequences? What's at stake? Not only are this negatively impacting na uh, Native peoples, um, um, there's just a lot of mis misconceptions and there's um, um, just so many um, misunderstandings that uh, continue a, a negative uh, um, perspective about who is an, an American Indian. So. We're still in survival mode, and I think we're fighting for our sovereign rights, but we're also fighting for our self-identification. So I, I guess what I see is um, great hope for, for our people, for Native nations. The history of Native America is really one of strength and resilience and persistence. Uh, we're the fastest growing segment of the population. Our incomes are rising faster than other segments, certainly not enough, uh, but we're seeing a very steady improvement. And I know that um, our history and, and, and our ways are, are really built around values of, of kindness and compassion and, and caring for one another. And I think that's really the key to, uh, to our future as well, is, is um, supporting each other and, and looking at it through the lens of um, sort of what are these colonial tools? Is it education? Is it uh, participating in the workforce? Is it holding office, you know, federal office? We're seeing uh, Native people being elected to very prominent positions. And that carries a voice, uh, you know, well beyond their particular community or their particular state. So I have really great hope that not only, not only are we going to be seen and no longer invisible, but we're going to be able to tell uh, an accurate story and use uh, the resources, real strong evidence to make good decisions and to uh, you know, m ensure that the, the services and the obligations uh, that are owed and due to Native peoples uh, are actually fulfilled. Thank you so much. That was Patrice Kunesh director of the Center for Indian Country Development at the Minneapolis Fed. That was a real pleasure. I really appreciate your time. Thank Thanks you. for stopping by the State of Working America podcast. You can watch us on YouTube. You can download us on iTunes, Stitcher, wherever you get your podcasts, or go to epi.org slash podcasts. Thank you so much for listening.